well, we're not really going over to me, we're going over to you. Uh, because the objective is for you to, to be able to ask your, uh, your questions. There's a big crowd uh, today, which is amazing on the one hand. On the other hand, we have a limited amount of time for the Q&A. Uh, so I'd, I'd ask you to be relatively, or let's say very brief in your question, to very clearly indicate as well uh, if you have someone in particular you're asking your question to, which will uh, help us with uh, the answers. Um, and um, I was informed that unfortunately Daniel will have to leave us um, in about 15 minutes, if I'm right. So if you've got a question that's specifically uh, directed uh, or, or, or uh, specifically concerns uh, Daniel, then you might want to ask that um, immediately. We'll try to group maybe three or four questions together <clears throat> um, so we can, uh, then, then the different speakers can, uh, can react. Uh, but once again, really, let's, let's, let's go for questions so uh, a big, big part of you can ask their questions. All right, please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for the organizers. On behalf of the Mission of Palestine, I just want to thank you very, very much, Mick and Claire and Mark Butanga and Manu and all the friends and MEPs. I see Anand, I see a lot of friends here, who has been our voice in, in halls that we are usually demonized and dehumanized. In. And of course, I want to thank Francesca and Diana and Daniel for being uh, also relentless uh, in their, and calling things as they are without, you know, uh, using the right terms. So I just want to say thank you and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you. That was a quick question. Maybe there behind. Uh, can you hear me? Well, first of all, thank you for this let's say presentation i have a specific question for francesca and first of all i would like to say that you have been up, up covering the the war in uh, israel as well in the past six months and you've been a, a lighthouse in a war that is going mad and so i wanted to ask you how it is uh, despite being a lighthouse working for an international organization which is indeed part or has had, let's say, a big responsibility in what is happening right now. And if you see uh, for the future uh, the necessity, let's say, to uh, reform the United Nations and, of course, in particular, the Security Council, we have seen that the United States has uh, blocked, I believe, three, if I'm not mistaken, uh, draft resolution for a ceasefire till the recent uh, adopted one. And the partition plan maybe already in 1947 was a mistake. So how do you uh, basically live through the dissonance that I'm sure you are, you are feeling? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe Darren, then we'll go here. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I will thank the presenters of this uh, presentation, but uh, uh, the question I have to, to to ask is that everybody here, most of us at least, I can take the risk, who are convinced on, on what's going on, the, the, at least the people who is here. Uh, and we, we, are not, uh, uh, we cannot say that we don't know. I speak about the citizens. We, we have media and we know now. We talk about accountabilities. We have delegated our citizen accountability to the uh, people who uh, present, uh, represent us as governments. I want to ask about what about individual accountability as citizens, not only as Jewish citizens, but as citizens, as a European citizen, what's my responsibility? I cannot say that I don't know. Is there an institution which takes care and addresses responsibilities to the citizens, to the individuals? Thank you. Thank you, and then I've got Anna here in front who wanted, and then we'll go to... Ah, okay, I didn't see her, but oh, there in the back. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you. I'll stand, I'll stand up. Thank you very much for this presentation. I think it's better if you sit down to be closer to the mic, really. Thank okay. you. Okay, <laughs> you should be right. Sorry. Uh, no, it is to say that I think when you're preaching to the uh, to the uh, converts here already, if not converts, we are the believers, uh, and I think we so much need to find ways what to do and how to do it. And I, 
my suggestion could be, and that is very much to you, Francesca, but it's also to Daniel, because he's sitting in a spot there. Couldn't we go for a kind of a coalition of the willings? We saw that a few years ago when uh, uh, Palestine was upgraded in the UN. It wasn't done unanimously. It couldn't be done. And I think it's, as far as I can look now, uh, close to impossible to get a unanimous position in the, in, the, in the council, as it is now. But instead of just saying, then we can do nothing, then we go to our member states and address them and find a way how we could figure out to make a, a, a considerable amount of member states who would start to, you know, sanctions are very difficult to do because it's also we should still respect international law uh, and find a way. But it must be possible that you could do uh, quite a lot of things where, where Israel can see and hear that now it's serious. And uh, uh, so isn't that an idea how this year could be done uh, so we can come out of this uh, uh, deadlock no deadlock, yes, it's more dead than lock. But uh, we are in now and figure out strategies. And we have all of us contact to national governments, national uh, uh, parliaments, and we should be able to make a kind of a network. We have a meeting here with the civil society in the 18th of April. Uh, you might have heard about it, this bottom-up coming here, 18th of April. But we need also a high-level uh, high-level uh, coalition of the willing. Sorry for the language there. Okay, let me maybe uh, then stop here for a moment and throw that question to Daniel as the, the, the last question. So Daniel, obviously, feel free to react to any of the, the remarks or questions that were there uh, before you before you have to, to leave us. And then we'll, we'll do the tour. Thanks so much. Um, so I'll say this, as citizens, and it also re relates to, to, to the last point, as citizens, of course, we're not just voters. We're, we're, we're workers. We live in, often in employment spaces, you know, union decisions, whether to onload, offload things going to or coming from uh, Israel. Uh, we're consumers. What do we buy? We can protest. We can, you know, sports. Remember what happened in South Africa. Sport is a fantastic, ungovernable space. A stadium is almost a free space. Now, you know, Europe's and the world's sporting governing bodies saw fit to take action in one place and not in another. There's an Olympics coming up. They've chosen to take action against one country participating, but not another. Um, so let's think about those spaces that are open to us to, to bring our concerns and our voices to. Um, I just want to say one thing, Diana, uh, who, who you, you, you moved me as you often do, Diana. Um, and you made me think about one thing that I wanted to share. Deanna and myself met each other first uh, across the negotiating table. Um, we weren't on the same side then. Um, and uh, we were in Tubba in January of 2001. And, and the thing that one of the things that most vividly sticks with me from that experience was that we were really, there was an Israeli attempt then, however one looks back on it, but taking it at some nominal level at face value to make sure that the injustice of 1948 could never be on the table. Why do I say that? Because although one was never addressing that, there was an Israeli insistence that in any potential putative fantasy even deal, three words would appear, end of claims, that Palestinians would not have any further claims. And we never discussed ever ideas of truth and reconciliation, of transitional justice. And as I reflect back on that, I think this path that we pursued of trying to pretend 
there was no Nakba. On the Israeli side, trying to impose that that could never be made whole or even discussed was part of a zero-sum dehumanization approach, which actual lived attempts at partition have taken us to where we are now. And I say that because I think in many places, in, 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 in Europe and elsewhere, uh, what has happened in this last six months and the hypocrisy of the political elites in how they've dealt with this has, has almost become an avatar for the injustice that we see in so many walks of daily life. But it's also ripped open a broader conversation on Palestine, Israel. And we have to be, I would argue, open to that conversation. Just we cannot go back to, well, if we have a moderate Palestinian authority and maybe a more moderate Israel, and then they'll meet together. And can we improve our security cooperation? And it's not what this is about. And I know that there is an attempt to make sure that we don't have that conversation. And there are things that we're not supposed to say or talk about, but those are precisely the things that need to be on the, the table today. I, I appreciate your indulgence in allowing me to say something before I leave. It's a huge honor to appear alongside Diana and Francesca. Uh, and and I, I think people who have spoken out and have done so from the get-go when we understood where this was going uh, should be credited. And, and thank you so much for, for, for the voice that you have been, those of you who are there and who are on this panel, uh, and for allowing us this opportunity this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, very much for being with us. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard the applause from, from this side. Very much appreciated the, the interventions. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go to Diana now for the, for the first reaction on the, on, the, on the first questions and comments, if you want to jump in. Yes, uh, thank you. How, what can we do? A lot of things. Um, look, I think it's really important for us to, again, be focusing on the BDS movement. And the BDS movement has made its goals clear from the very beginning. Um, we, we know that the point of it is to, actually, I'm gonna step back for a second so people understand the kind of the, the history of it. Um, in, in 2004, so many, many, many years ago, right? 20 years ago, the first time that the Palestinians went to the ICJ, was in relation to the decision regarding the wall, this illegal monstrosity that runs in between um, Palestinian cities and communities in the West Bank, uh, twice the length of the Green Line, you know, eight meters high, 50 meters deep in certain port points. It's a monstrosity. It shouldn't exist. And back in uh, February of 2004, we, and I was part of the team, went to the ICJ to ask the, the ICJ for a ruling about whether this wall was legal. And the court came out with three things, um, and this is all gonna link to one another, so, so give me a minute. So the court came out and said three things. One, they said the wall is illegal. We knew that, and again, you don't need to be a lawyer to know that stealing land is illegal. Um, second is they said that Israel can't use this claim of self-defense when it came to the wall. And then third, and this part was really important, is that it, that other states, so third states have an obligation to make sure that, um, that this wall is not recognized as legal and that they don't deal with it as legal. And they have uh, obligations under international humanitarian law. This is the first time the court came out with, with this ruling when it comes to international humanitarian law and the responsibility of third states. Why am I mentioning this? because the decision came out on July the 9th of 2004. And, uh, and I remember the day very well. Palestinians waited and we waited and we waited and we wait. And you know what we did? We were saying, finally, you know, the, the, the Europeans, the world, you know, it's all like, they're all suddenly gonna act 
because this is no longer just us saying it because we've been so dehumanized that they don't listen to our voices, but we now have the International Court of Justice saying the same. And, and so we waited and 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 we waited for countries to step forward and say that they were going to do something in relation to this wall. And sure enough, once again, crickets, right? They did nothing. And so exactly a year, exactly a year to the day that that ICJ decision came out. So the decision comes out July the 9th, 2004, exactly a year later, July the 9th of 2005, was when the BDS movement was relaunched. I say relaunched because there had always been some type of BDS, but this was relaunched. Why is that important? Because it's important for us to recognize that law and all of these systems are just tools, but that we as individuals have obligations as well. The states have obligations, but the powerful never willingly gave up power. We have to force them to do it. And so what can be done? Everything from... Um, I'm not sure why Israel's still in Eurovision. I know the historic reasons, but it's not, it doesn't make any sense that they're still in it. Um, number two, when it comes to, to the Olympics, how is it that Russia was, has been uh, sidelined, but, um, but Israel's not? Third, when it comes to other things like FIFA, sporting events, again, these are the things that we must do. And it's using the tools of the boycott, divestment sanctions that we have to keep pushing individually and push them on a government level to hold Israel to account so that they don't feel that they're just like a normal country. You know, they think it's normal to be able to commit genocide. That I'm telling you, they actually think that what they're doing is normal. Um, but then there's more. And, and this part is important as well. I don't think that this genocide would have been able to have been carried out had it not been for the role of Western mainstream media. The Western media has been covering up these crimes and in particular, and this one makes me irate, in particular, the 17th of October when Israel bombed an Ahli hospital, the Baptist hospital in Gaza. Somehow, even though Israel never denied it, they turned it into, oh, somehow it's the Palestinians that bombed their own hospital. Well, 23 hospitals later, and with the destruction, practical destruction of a Shifa hospital, what the mainstream media did was they made it okay. They normalized Israel attacking hospitals. They've normalized Israel attacking UNRWA schools. They've normalized Israel attacking mosques. They've, I mean, time after time after time, you'll even see a doctor go on TV after having spent a couple of weeks in Gaza. And the first question they, they get asked is, is there Hamas there? As though this is somehow normal. They've normalized attacking humanitarian convoys. They've normalized They've normalized the not allowing food in. They've normalized to not to be able to go after people providing food. This is what they have normalized. That's all been normalized. And this has been normalized because Western media has not challenged it. This is where your job comes in. It's up to you to be pushing back against this narrative. Because again, this narrative, this genocide would not have been able to have happened so so easily had it not been for um, Western mainstream media. Thank you very much, Anna. And then before we go to the second round of questions, I'll uh, give the word to Francesca if you want to react on any of the comments. Uh, I would like to add, uh, really to take from what, um, where, from where um, Diana ended on the role of the media, because there is one particular thing that has been disturbing and has created a sense of fear, which was already existing when talking about Israel, Palestine, the occupied Palestinian territory, but has been amplified. And it's the fact that there is, uh, although even the United Nations have said, we do not refer to Hamas as a terrorist organization, which doesn't mean that what Hamas has done, I mean, you can qualify what Hamas has done on the 7th of October against Israeli civilians as terrorism. This is besides the point. Terrorism doesn't exist as a category per se under international law, and therefore 
the, the, I've qualified it as war crimes. Does it make it lighter? Absolutely not. But the point is that there has been such an amplification of Hamas as terrorist, 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 that when Israel targeted everyone, everyone associated with Hamas, including doctors, nurses, uh, civil servants, police, to the point that even the U.S. had to, had to say, don't kill all police officers, otherwise the or law and order will collapse. This is the thing. There has been this legitimization of Israel going after Hamas and not just after combatants, because even soldiers, including Israeli soldiers, when they are off duty, are not a legitimate target. And this applies to everyone. A combatant is a legitimate target only while combating. And, and again, there has been so much ignorance, which leads me to the first comment that was, was made probably by one of my co-nationals, judging from what you <laughs> pronounce my name um, correctly. Um, there is a, a, an Italian philosopher from the past century, who, uh, Norberto Bobbio, who used to say, knowing before discussing and discussing before condemning. And then this is something good that we all should do, because again, the question of Israel and Palestine has been there for so long that on the one hand there is this attitude, oh, but they really cannot get along, right? No, they, they can't because one is occupying and colonizing and the other has been left with no means, including peaceful means like BDS. BDS has been criminalized for asking for what? For measures that are even uh, afforded by the UN Charter, like economic, political and diplomatic measures to react to protracted wrongful act, internationally wrongful act, and BDS has been criminalized. And today, talking of BDS is anathema. We are scared, not me, but we are scared, not, <laughs> not my, <laughs> but we are scared to, thank you, Diana, talk about BDS, but BDS is a peaceful resistance movement and tries to have simply the application of international law because no one is above the law. And so there are a couple of things there. First of all, on top of the media, there is something that our governments in Europe have done, not only supporting, aiding and abetting what Israel has done since the 7th of October, and sorry to say before, because the building of settlements is a war crime, and I've said it at least twice, if not three times, in this room. It's a war crime, so, it's, and it's a state enterprise. It's not just about the labeling. I mean, we are still banging our head against the wall about the labeling and not accepting settlement, settlement products on our markets. It's a state enterprise. And so it's the state of Israel. And I don't say that out of hate for Israel. It's out of love. Because if Israel is not stopped now, it's going head down, really nose diving toward the end of itself and its collectivity, its society, and we are seeing that. So our, our governments in Europe, what they have done, they've also punished the people standing in solidarity for Palestinian rights, including Jewish, Jewish Europeans, Germany, Italy, France, what is that? So this is also what I heard today calling the banalization of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is there, for sure, like racism, anti-Palestinian racism, Islamophobia phobia, and many things that go with our ra <laughs> unresolved racism. But the thing is that if we do not react when our freedoms, freedom of expression, the right to protest are eroded, what are we going to do? And this is beyond, beyond Palestine. On the, collect, on the coalition of the willing, I would say first find the willing because I, there is, a, there is a, an issue there. And I recognize that there are Ireland and Belgium and Luxembourg and Spain and Portugal who have been more outspoken. And that's it. Now it's time for the willing to, to come forward and say like South Africa did. Mind you, it was not the African Union. It was South Africa alone going to the ICJ. And South Africa knows that it will be alone against the storm. But it took it on itself because the wounds of the apartheid, the wounds of 300 of 
300 years of colonialism are still felt by each living being in South Africa. So it's our responsibility to take up the, the, the duty of citizenship and make sure with, in any role we have as teachers, as buyers, as workers, consumers, as whatever you, you are doing, it's the time, as I said once, not, it doesn't make me very popular, to break the ranks. Like many, uh, many, official, many civil servants of the European Union have done. I mean, we don't, you, you don't have to be complicit in everything. Take a step. United, we can resist this madness. Okay. So we'll do a second round, but I'll have to be a lot stricter on time, not just for the questions, also for the answers. Um, so I already had Anna, I had here one, and then still here and there. So please be very quick in the questions so we can get the answers, because we still we have 10 minutes left, so it's very short. Okay, I'm very quick. Um, I'm a member of the European Parliament, a member of the delegation of Palestine, and since last week I'm no more member of the delegation of Israel that I was member because I don't apply and no complicity with the genocide because I was member of the delegation of Israel and last year when I was in the delegation of Palestine they don't allow me to go and they haven't defend and they bring here people defending the genocide as the vice president as the president of the Knesset delegation and members of the European Parliament like Mark, Claire, Mick, I have here a big list, Margaret, Clary, Doya, Miguel, Sandra, Joao, Marisa, Margaret, Claire, Tineke. We are not so much, but we are, and we are members here defending the Palestinian rights, and especially like you, very proud of you, Francesca, because you are a hope for us. Uh, and really, we have the responsibility to take up as citizens, as individual citizens, as governments and societies. I agree that all the peaceful resistance is criminalized, but we are also, as members of the European Parliament, criminalized as anti-Semit, uh, as friends of Hamas, as uh, everything. We are in any category of uh, wars for uh, Israel. And in the time that we are working for peace, they are, and I finish, they are doing the lobby with the consent of the European Parliament, civil servants, and also of the European Union. And it's for that we have here a big coalition of not major, with majority, but with dignity to defend also your report, because your report is our uh, base also to have uh, uh, really a change of the history and especially the end of the, of the occupation and also the support to Palestinian rights. So many, many thanks on behalf of, of me personally, but also of the uh, movement in my country, in Galicia, as I showed you before, that is Galicia con Palestina. We are a people also very solidar with the Palestinians. And also, thank you, uh, Francesca. Thank you very much, Anna. I'll go here. So, very quick question, particularly to Diana. Uh, you and Daniel Levy also talked about our, our accountability and planning the day after. Uh, what sorts of measures of accountability can we plan and can we expect in our governments here, in Europe and the Western world? Because obviously, you, there will be a need for accountability. It's something that's going to be unavoidable in Palestine. But over here, there will be a reaction of just evading, pretending, well, it's not our country involved. How do we hold accountable the governments, the companies, universities, any structure that supported this? Thank you very much. I'll first go there. Hi, thank you so much, uh, everyone involved. I just had a question going back to the sanctions. Uh, what is being planned at the EU level? And uh, what about the question of an energy embargo? I know this is a uh, strategy that has come up recently in grassroots levels. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the last question here. Okay, I have a question for which uh, I do have the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you. Uh, so uh, basically, 
we obviously uh, contemplating the fact that the entire world is literally paralyzed in front of this genocide. So the question is, why is it so? And uh, don't we have to look into areas like uh, Israeli lobbies across the Western world, or even when it comes to any countries in the neighborhood, uh, like the Arab world, for instance, by Iran or any other Turkeys or whatever, completely paralyzed as well. Um, and they're not, they don't feel able to go ahead with any kind of uh, interference. Are we not referring to the fact that uh, Israel has six submarines with something like 400 nuclear bombs uh, navigating across the oceans in the world and is probably the only country in the world who's, which is willing to use them? So, again, why are we paralyzed? Does anyone have an answer? I know it's a very difficult question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you very soon, but really 30 seconds. Yes, so uh, my question is, I have uh, contributed to crowdfunding to um, help people from Gaza to get away. So my question is, if we shouldn't be doing more to, sa to simply save people in Gaza, taking into account that things uh, are not changing. And, and th thank you, D Diana, your, your strength is really, really incredible. So I'll go back to Diana first. Uh, then I'm gonna ask you to stick to, let's say two and a half minutes, something, um, so we can get the last answers in and close on time. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna do it exactly in two and a half minutes. All right, so uh, crowdfunding. I'm gonna go backwards. Um, crowdfunding. Look, there's the there's a lot of debate around this issue of crowdfunding, um, and I'll explain why. The Egyptian government is, or it's an Egyptian company that's charging exorbitant fees in order to get people out of Gaza. Eight thousand dollars per adult, five thousand dollars per child. Most uh, most families in Gaza cannot afford this, and even if they are paying for that money. Um, it's the it's not a guarantee that they're going to be able to leave. Um, plus, it's it feels like it's a GoFundMe to become a refugee. That's how bad the situation is. So the question is, should we continue to to fund those? I'm on the fence when it comes to it. I I I can't tell somebody to remain in Gaza when when the conditions are so miserable. But I do think that we have an obligation to make sure that Israel doesn't continue to make it miserable. In other words, what Israel's done is set up a system where if you want medical uh, attention, you leave. If you want education, you leave. If you want to have a normal life, you leave. If you want to have your children to to have a future, you leave. Um, and so we have to reject against that, push back against that. And that's why I think it's so important for us to be really working now on this issue of uh, of accountability. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the entire world paralyzed. Why? I don't know. But I actually don't think that the entire world is paralyzed either. I think that we've seen a lot of action when it comes to the Houthis in um, in Yemen and in other places as well. I think that the global south has been has been um, uh, has been rising up and and uh, and speaking out. The question is why the governments are not, and that I actually don't really have an answer. Do I think that there's this huge um, Israel lobby? Not really. Um, I think that that's a very convenient excuse on the part of the American administration to do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, what do I think about an energy embargo? I don't know. I'd have to look a little bit more into it. And in my last 30 seconds, what does accountability on the day after look like? How is it that these countries are going to evade? This is where your work must begin now. I'm, I don't live in Europe. I don't know the entire system within Europe, but I do know that what they're trying to do is to sweep everything under the rug, to turn it into um, providing humanitarian assistance and not dealing with the political, we must focus on dealing with the political and what that means. And that's why I think that pushing to hold Israelis accountable, pushing to hold Israeli soldiers accountable, pushing to hold the these um, political figures accountable. You know, it doesn't make sense to me why Yoav Gallant is, be, is able to travel to Europe when he's made it clear that he wants to commit genocide and has committed genocide against uh, Palestinians. So this is, I think, a, a bigger question um, when I don't have two and a half minutes. So there you go. I finished in under two and a half minutes. There you go. That's an, an most excellent. Thank you very much, and then Francesca. Oof, two minutes, all right. I'll, um, no, not two. Uh, two, 
just I would like to comment on two things. Uh, why the system is paralyzed? I I, I agree with um, with Diana. I don't think that it's just a pro-Israel lobby if we do not understand that what we call pro-Israel lobby is part of a system, and I call it the settler colonial club, which is Europe, the United States, Australia, uh, Canada, and New Zealand, and Israel. So it's, we need to come to terms with what white supremacy has been and continues to be. Because this is the only way to overcome not only the injustice in Palestine, but injustice that reverberates across the world. I mean, Palestine today is a symbol of resistance for the global south because we treat everyone like, I mean, Europe and other Western states treat everyone like, uh, like the, 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 the Palestinians. And the reason why Palestine is still so uh, visible is because of the Palestinians and their resilience and, uh, and their resistance. And um, so come to terms with racism, which leads to my second point. I often, and I believed so 10 years ago, we often think that we have this sense of guilt toward the Jewish people. No, we don't. Because had we learned what anti-Semitism is, we would fight against every form of dehumanization. And we don't. I mean, I understand why Israelis feel so protected by Israel, why Jewish people around the world have this myth of Israel, which is real. It's because they've been discriminated against even after the Holocaust. It took years for them to be acknowledged. There were boats of the um, uh, survivors of uh, concentration camps being pushed back by the US, by Australia, and by, by the UK. And they had nowhere to go other than Israel, uh, uh, Palestine. And, uh, and the thing is that it, this is a knot of history, and this is a knot in our thought. Either, either we solve it, either we address the, com the complications behind it and historical injustices that are connected to it, or we will still be stuck, and the Palestinians and the Israelis with us by paying the huge price for it. And that's it, two minutes. <laughs>